Greetings to all of you in the name of our risen Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Today our text comes to us from our Old Testament lesson. And these are obviously words of scripture that Jesus had in mind when he spoke about humility as we heard Pastor Weekman read our gospel lesson for today. They're simple words of advice. Yet no one can truly have the motivation to carry them out unless he or she has first learned the humility that comes from having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And of course, that relationship comes to us as the Holy Spirit creates that faith in our hearts, that relationship in our hearts through word and sacrament. That's what we're going to explore this morning as we turn our attention to the book of Proverbs, chapter 25, and we're just focusing on those two verses, 6 and 7, where we have some words of wisdom that come to us from a king, an actual king, King Solomon, who under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says to us, Do not exalt yourself in the king's presence, and do not claim a place among great men. It is better for him to say to you, Come up here than for him to humiliate you before a nobleman. Thus, our text for this morning. Well, dear friends in Christ, before we dig into the wisdom of our text, I want to play a little game with you. I want you to help me solve a riddle. I want you to see if you can guess who I am talking about through this description. She's a young woman who works all day long as a servant for her wicked stepmother and stepsisters. They're very mean to her and they let her wear rags for clothes. And one day the, the king of the land, he throws this big party and everyone's invited, but not her. And the girl cries because she can't go and then a, a fairy godmother appears and changes her rags into a beautiful gown and turns a pumpkin into a stagecoach and mice into horses. And the girl gets to go to that party where everyone, including the prince himself, are amazed by the beauty of this young woman who no one seems to know. But she has to leave before midnight because her stagecoach will turn back into a pumpkin at the strike of 12. And she's in such a hurry as she's running down the steps, she leaves one of her glass slippers there. And the prince searches the entire kingdom for the girl who can fit perfectly into that slipper. Finally, he arrives at the girl's home, but only the stepsisters and the, uh, are allowed to try on the, the slipper, but it's much too small for either one of them. And as the prince is leaving, he runs into this girl. He has her try on the slipper, and it fits perfectly. And she marries that prince, and they live happily ever after. Who is that girl? Now I'm guessing that the vast, vast majority of you, even the ones who can't read, probably know the answer. We're talking about Cinderella, aren't we? We're all familiar with that fairy tale of Cinderella. But have you ever thought about the fact that we also have some things in common with Cinderella? And so as we look at our text this morning, I want you to have that Cinderella story in the back of your mind and consider this question. Who are you more like? Cinderella or the evil stepsisters? Now the picture that Solomon paints for us or sets before us in our text is a banquet that we've all been invited to. And he warns all of us, he says, do not exalt yourself in the king's presence and do not claim a place among great men. Now, as I mentioned just a moment ago, in today's gospel lesson, Jesus was thinking of these words of Solomon when he was about to eat at a feast of a Pharisee. And there Jesus noticed that everyone was trying to, to get a good seat, to get a place of honor to show how important that they wanted to look to others. But Jesus tells us that if we do that, then we run the risk of the host telling us to go to a lower spot when someone more important comes along and will be humiliated. 
Instead, Jesus says, we should always take a lowly spot so that the host can say to us, hey, come up here to a better spot, and he'll do so in front of everyone. Then we'll be honored. Then we will actually be exalted. And then Jesus said something that he often said in his ministry. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So with that in mind, let's do a little soul searching. Which one describes us better? The one who exalts himself or the one who humbles himself? It's certainly natural for us to want to be praised by other people instead of ridiculed. We want other people to say nice things about us instead of nasty things. And that's not wrong in and of itself. But it's when that natural desire for being praised hurts others in the process or puts us higher than we ought to be that both Solomon and Jesus say that's a problem. When Solomon says, do not exalt yourself in the king's presence, those words there, exalt yourself, have the basic meaning of something getting bigger, something swelling up. If you blow up a balloon, the air inside that balloon does the very thing that's being described here. It swells up. And that's good for a balloon because that's what balloons are for. But it's bad for us. It's where we get the expression, he's got a big head. Has there anyone ever said to you, with a head as big as yours, you're not even going to be able to go through the door. That's a not so subtle way of saying Stop being arrogant. Stop being all puffed up about yourself. Are you arrogant? Have you ever thought about that? Well, do you do things like uh, hold doors open for the elderly? Or maybe a mother with a bunch of kids? Or maybe just for anyone, just because you're being nice? Do you help a neighbor if they need help in some way, like watching their kids while they go to the store or maybe watching their house while they're on vacation? You ever do things like that? Well, there might be hope for you. I mean, that at least shows that you're not completely self-centered. But the real test comes in what you do, not in public, but in your own house. When you and only you and your family, and of course God, who knows all, can see what you do. You kids, you young people here in the congregation today, do you willingly do the things that your parents ask you to do? Like doing the dishes? Like making your beds? Like being kind to others, including your brothers and sisters? And do you do it without complaining? And do you do those things all the time? And do you do it without even being asked? Those of you who are married, are you arrogant? Do you constantly submit to one another in love? I mean, all the time? Would you put your own ambitions, maybe even your own career, on hold if you knew that it was best for you as a couple or as a family? Is your spouse doing most of the work around the house? And do you tell yourself that you're just too busy to help? Are you really that busy? Now, I get it. I understand that everybody needs some me time. But if your me time happens all the time, then guess what? You are arrogant. You've exalted yourself. And how does that work out in a marriage? Not well, does it? In fact, take a look at the happy and successful marriages around you and you'll find that it's people who are both serving each other out of love. They're the ones who have a marriage that is happy and fulfilling. It really can be that simple. And if your marriage is in trouble or has seen maybe better days, could you be the problem? 
could exalting yourself be interfering? And those of you who are single, you're not immune to exalting yourselves either. If you're single, you're still called upon to serve others in love as well. Can you honestly say that you do that all the time? Or are there times when you'd just rather serve yourself? I give these examples here because when, it, when it, you get right down to it, when you look at how, what we've done, how well we've done in serving others as God commands each and every one of us to do, well then more often than not, we look more like those wicked stepsisters than we do Cinderella. We are the ones that take the place of honor there at the feast. We want to put our feet into that glass slipper. And as a result, we deserve to be humiliated. And not just in front of all the others at the feast. Because of our sinful natures, that sinful nature that all of us possesses, and the arrogant, self-centered actions that that sinful nature produces, we should be brought to our knees in humility forever eternally cast out of the presence of God. And like Cinderella crying because she couldn't go to the ball, we would be weeping forever without hope and without God outside those closed doors where there is only weeping and gnashing of teeth that last for eternity. That is indeed the fate of all people including you and me, if left only to our own devices, our own abilities, our own strength to get to heaven. Because left on our own, we can only struggle in the quicksand of our own sin. And the more we struggle in that quicksand of sin with our own strength, the deeper we sink until we receive the hell that we all deserve. That's why we truly can say, on our own, we are without any hope. But we do have hope, don't we? By the grace of God, someone did come to our rescue. And it wasn't our fairy godmother. That's just for fairy tales. Real life, believe it or not, is much better than even a fairy tale. Because you see, in real life, God himself came to our rescue in the person of God the Son, Jesus Christ. Listen to how the Apostle Paul describes it in his letter to the Philippians. He says, Christ Jesus made himself nothing. Now you want to talk about humility? Listen to what he just said. There is real humility. The God of all that exists, God Almighty, made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, he humbled himself. And here's where his humility takes it even a step further. And became obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, dear people, in utter humility, Jesus took all of our filthy rags of arrogance and self-importance onto himself. And of course, because he had our rags on, that meant that he couldn't go to the feast. But that was his whole purpose. He was damned in them when he was nailed to the cross and covered with the filth and the condemnation of all of our sins. But he willingly took them upon himself. He was shut out from the presence of the eternal king, God himself, even though Jesus himself is the eternal king also. Now, don't worry if that boggles the mind. Just know that in doing so, Jesus paid in full the price for all of our arrogance, all of our self-centeredness, all of our pride, every single sin. But that's not all. In the place of the shabby rags of sin that we were wearing, he also gave us brand new clothes. He gave us a robe of his own righteousness, his own perfect humbleness before God and others. And as a result of our Savior's work, 
God the Father can and does welcome us into the wedding feast of the Lamb for all eternity. Through the working of the Holy Spirit, when God called you to faith, in essence, he was saying, come up here, to use the words of Solomon. Come up here to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Come up here to my heaven. And we can take it even a step further. Jesus exchanged places with you. You were a sinner shut out from that feast. But Jesus gave you his place of honor at the feast. You couldn't take that place of honor by living a good enough, enough life. You couldn't live a good enough life if you had a thousand lifetimes to live. You had to be given that place of honor by none other than God himself through Christ's finished work. Think about that for a moment. What a humbling thing that is to know what our gracious God has done for you personally. Heaven is ours through Christ. Through his humility, though we don't deserve it one iota, we have been exalted. And now that you've been given a place of honor, how big will your head be? as you live in and for Christ. Will you seek to exalt yourself in this life? You know, as strange as it may sound, with your new natures in Christ, you actually want to serve your, your brothers and sisters in Christ. You actually want to serve your spouse and to make them happy. You actually want to serve others, to serve your coworkers, your neighbors, as well as those less blessed than you are even those in prison. Now, why on earth would you want to do that? Because after seeing how Jesus has served you so completely, the only thing that we want to do is to live in humble service to God. Anything else would be sheer arrogance. So how do we live in humble service to God? By living in humble service to others. Even that stranger who has never done anything nice for you, we will want to serve them because Christ served us so completely. You know, in the world of sports, for example, every once in a while an individual will come along or maybe a team will come along that doesn't look very impressive at all, but still manages to win the gold medal or the World Series or a national championship or the Super Bowl. I'm thinking in particular of that miracle team they made a movie out of, the U.S. hockey team in 1980, defeating the USSR and winning the gold. Or maybe Mary Lou Retton, who in 1984 became the very first American gymnast to win the gold, even though just weeks prior to that she had had to undergo knee surgery. Or maybe you've seen the movie Hoosiers, where you have this little team of nothing that go on to win it all. We call events like those Cinderella stories, don't we? And we call them Cinderella stories because they were no names, but they end up winning the whole thing. Well, understand, dear people, because Jesus humbled himself for us, you are no longer a no-name, but have been given the blessed distinction of being called a precious child of God whose very name is written in the book of life. God has called all of us to a place of honor at the feast in heaven. And we are humbled by the Lord's love and work that has exalted us to this wonderful place of honor in his heaven. And while it's true that we have much in common with those evil stepsisters in how we've treated others, and sometimes, if we're honest, shamelessly, shamefully, I should say, those and all the other sins have been fully forgiven. In Christ, we now have on different clothes to wear, clothes to be worn at a wedding banquet of the Lamb. And so because of Jesus... You actually now have more in common with Cinderella. Because of Jesus, ours is a Cinderella story. And one more thing. 
You'll remember that at the end of the Cinderella story, even though those stepsisters mistreated Cinderella all the time, after she marries the prince, what does she do? Well, she's kind to her stepsisters. In your family, in your marriages, in your treatment of others, show how the Lord's humility for you reflects in your humility before God as you live out your earthly days with a servant heart. Let that shine. Amen.